things all of my fellows have put together over the years. So this is like a conglomeration of three or four people. As they were reading their books to study for their board review, right, or their board test, I they just came up with the questions that they would ask or they would think would be important. So, and I think it's pretty helpful as far as that goes. So, all right. This is not one that's like, hold on, I want you guys just to talk, but I'm just going to give you information. We're to that point of where, when's your OCAP? Yeah, so this is just brew memory. Eyelid cancer simulates a Chalazian. Yeah. How long does it usually take before somebody is diagnosed with a sebaceous cell? It's a lot. It's like, is it like three months, six months? Some studies say 10 months even. Oh. Crazy, right? Because people just keep treating it in a busy clinic, and then all of a sudden they realize, wait, this isn't going away, and they biopsy it, and then... Why does it look like papillary conjunctivitis? Yeah. So this is really important. There is some question of how you do biopsies on this now, but map biopsies for your sake, looking at your book, look to me like that's what they still recommend. And often you'll do a sentinel, a sentinel node biopsy as well with this. So excision with sentinel node biopsy, tissue handling and staining, those are big. And yeah, they'll actually, they can actually do a study that shows them where it's draining and they go to it. Yep. So typically it's going to be right here, but they'll actually do a study to see. And these are, so what, what they deemed were the most important things are in red. So why are cells vacuolated on the slides? Got lots of lipid. Yeah. Okay. Classic. Look how it distorts the architecture. This is a good, and I think this is a great representation right there. So, does this work? Should. Hey. All right. Next. Okay, we'll end of that. Okay. Which glands did it come from? Uh, glands of. Both. <laughs> So think about that, it's also Zeiss. Each time I look at that, I'm like, oh yeah, that's right. Most common location? The upper lid. Why? More that's how I think of it. I don't know if that's actually true, but there's more. What is it? Is it 40 and 20? So depending on the studies you, looked at, you look at, some say like 60 and 30, some say 40 and 20, but there's about two times as many. Let's see. Okay. What's your differential? Neuroblastoma. Or That's a good differential. Rectal. Yeah. So usually neuroblastoma is one that'll give you a bruise. There was an infection that you hardly ever see anymore that used to do this too. Hemophilus. Yep. So they grabbed dough. And then also, but realistically here, I would think neuroblastoma. So, but the rabbit is in there as well, derived from. So these are from azangle cells. It, this does not come from the recti. It does not. And that is a very important distinction. Management, chemo and radiation. If you have an isolated rhabdomyosarcoma to the orbit and you treat it with radiation, in most studies, what is the prognosis? Very good. 95% cure. Really good. So, if it's not isolated to the orbit, though, they're going to get that. Once it, once it leaves the orbit or once they're a a lot worse. But I would say here, I would still think of this, the bruise doesn't make you think of a neuroblastoma. And if it's bilateral, neuroblastoma. What, what are the age differences between rhabdomyosarcoma and neuroblastoma? Neuroblastoma is like, I mean, what's the person less than two? Yeah. Yeah, so I usually think of like two and eight. So rabbit is usually around eight, neuro is usually around two. Okay, stain for abnormal cells, Desmond. There you go. You tell it's superiorly located, why? Because you have displacement downward, right? So you have exophthalmos 
and downward displacement of the globe. And this is the kind of stuff. So, most common is embryonal, right? 8% of cases. Location, superior nasal. Specifically, superior. The superior nasal is the most common. Survival is good, again, 94, 95% with isolation to the orbit. Most lethal is alveolar, which is usually inferior, 10% survival. That's a bad one, okay? And then best survival is pleomorphic. Look at that. So it's, I've only seen this one a couple of times. I've seen this a bunch of times. I've only seen this a couple of times. Everyone might know this, but there's a really good mnemonic. Everyone has embryonal, awful, alveolar, and please give me a pleomorphic. It's for like the different nice. types of like, you know, what they're known for. That's great. It's an awful question, but just in case you guys haven't read that. Very, very good. Brad, say that again. So everyone has embryonal, so it's the, uh, it's the most common. Yeah. Awful, yeah. alveolar, the most lethal, and then please give me pleomorphic, because it's the best survival. prognosis. That's a great way of thinking about it. Chris Bear, thanks for showing up, man. All right, so let's see. Let's do orbital wall bones. Okay. We just have the sphenoid wing, all except for the floor, right? What's the floor made up of? Zygomatic. And what's that last one? Yeah, the palatine that no one ever sees, right? It's like a little tiny bone in the back. Okay, so roof, lesser wing, medial. Mediocantal swelling in an infant. Okay. If it's above the mediocantal tendon, what are you considering? What are you worried about? What's the differential on it? Yeah, anything, meningocele, cephalos, so anything along those lines, right? So you want to get an MRI. Do you want to probe that? No. Has it been done? No. You know when this usually happens is when someone has like multiple craniofacial anomalies. And why would you probe a kid urgently, like in an ICU or something like that? An infant. They're obligate nasal breathers, right? So about 30% of nasal lacrimal duct obstructions will also have a sac that goes into the nose, blocks off their airway, they can't breathe. So a great question, I think, would be a two-day-old baby is known to be in respiratory distress and they have bilateral mediocantal swelling. What do you do? You probe it. I mean, not all centers up first to make sure that's what I was doing, but then you probe it, all right? Okay, if it's below the mediocantal tendon and sometimes bluish, not always. Dacrocystocil. Okay. What's the management of a dacrocystocil? Don't you just massage it? So massage is a typical thing. It's interesting how many of these you look at most studies. I can't remember what your book says. But a lot of studies will show these things get infected. But if you can reduce it just by massaging it, that's great. A lot of people advocate if there's any question at all if these are causing any breathing issues or if they at all are getting red or anything, you, you probe them pretty, pretty quickly. Dagger says still you have a blockage where... Superiorly and inferiorly, right? Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. And that's exactly what you normally would do unless it looks like it's problematic. And then I can tell you, so I had a colleague, he was a pediatric ophthalmologist. He ran our main satellite. And that guy can give these things to go away. <laughs> he was just like, and then get, get rid of them. <laughs> Massage times one minute. Yeah, he does. You remember uh, you when we were out at uh, West Campus? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, what about there? What do you do with that? Antibiotics. Antibiotics first, let it cool off, and then probe it. You got to let it cool off first. Why? Because you get more nasal, pa you get more false passages probably, and then also the infection can just spread easier, is my thought. But that's the general consensus. You admit, treat it, let it calm down, and then problem. 
Okay. Forest eyelid closure is the orbital portion, right? Involuntary eyelid closure, pretarsal. Okay, Mueller's muscle. How many millimeters of elevation do you typically get if you do a Mueller-ectomy? Those two. Yeah. Is a Mueller-ectomy considered heretical in the acuplastics world? <laughs> no, it's not. Two millimeters is the average. Where does it insert? Right above the tarsus. Yeah, so superior border of the tarsal plate, right? The levator inserts where? Anterior portion of the tarsus. So I think this is a great question. So any, again, I didn't come up with these, like Bellows did. It, anytime I'm cutting down onto the anterior surface of the tarsus, I'm cutting their aponeurosis. I'm cutting their levator. Right? But there's so many attachments, it doesn't make a difference. It's the inferior one half of the anterior tarsus. So if you got a question that said, if you take a pin and you stick that pin through the lid at like two millimeters above the eyelid margin, if you see the aponeurosis listed underneath the orbicularis, then that's the answer, right? A lot of times they don't list this, and I don't know why, because that is a critically important thing to mention. So more, most of the time you'll see the books will say it goes through skin, orbicularis, then tarsus, and then conch. It's actually not exactly right. It's skin, orbicularis, aponeurosis, then the tarsus, and then the conch, right? So if you saw that, that you remember, that thing's attaching down there. It's like when people don't even mention T-knots or something, right? So, oh, this is stuff he's got to memorize. So intraocular, millimeter, orbital. This becomes a big deal for me, like when I'm doing an optic nerve glioma resection or something like that, or a denucleation, if they have a <coughs> intraocular tumor or something, I want to try to get as much of the nerve segment as I can. So when Nick says to me, he has 22 millimeters or 25 millimeters of optic nerve, I'm like, sweet, that's pretty good. But, you know, if I have like two millimeters or something, I'm like, mm, probably should add more. You should get like either nine, right? And then intracranial is 16. Optic nerve segments. Okay. Which segment is the most susceptible to injury with blood trauma to the head? So what do you get? I'm sure. It's, it's an optic neuropathy, right? Traumatic optic neuropathy. Um, which bone makes up the optic canal? Okay. Oh, I love this question. It's a lateral, or contralateral nipple. Oh, that's a good way of looking at it. <laughs> okay. So, okay. So is it, is it anterior or posterior? Posterior. 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 Okay. Is it lateral or medial? Lateral. lateral. Okay. So in the, you're obviously going down, but then it's also posterior. Well, I guess the way you lateral. Lateral. lateral, though, from... It's lateral from the punctum because think about where your turbinates are. Think of your nose. Just follow your nose trajectory. It's going to go down like this. So that's how it'll go. So if you think of where your turbinate's going to be, that inferior turbinate. Where does this go? Which nipple is it? I guess it's it's laterally. Why do you have to? You can anyway. So. Awesome. <laughs> where, where does this enter? Where does the nasal aqueduct enter in the nose? Inferior meatus. When we do a DCR, where do we put that new hole? The middle meatus, right? Big difference. What bones are you removing when you do it in a DCR? The anterior lacrimal crest and the posterior lacrimal crest, essentially, right? So what makes up the anterior lacrimal crest? Uh -huh. And what makes up the posterior lacrimal crest? Lacrimal bone, right? Those are important. Okay, so let's do canaliculitis. Pretty classic looking. They call it the pouting punctum or whatever. Usually I just see some pus right here, and then I see some red surrounding it, right? This is the most missed thing I ever see, next to probably thyroiditis. What's the number one sign in thyroid eye disease? Most common finding? Eyelid retraction. It's like lists one through 50, right? Eyelid retraction. So 
Caliculitis, though, almost every time I see this, the person will say, I've been to like five different people, right? It's probably similar to I just keep treating under II and then I find out they have like a corneal dystrophy or something. I don't know. <laughs> Usual bacteria. Genomyces is rightly, right? Okay. Oh, man. Which muscle is not affected with your retrobulbar block? Okay. Why? Yeah, okay. So, these are just good to know. What are the possible complications of a retrobulbar block? Respiratory depression. Yeah? So, it can have permanent diplopia from it, right? Open globe. Yeah, all those things. Um, diplopia is actually a, a, a relatively common one that doesn't go away. So, good to know. Eye movement maintained in cyclotorgia. So, okay. Structure between the greater and lesser wings of the sphenoid. Okay, screw of fissure, right? Structures that go through the screw of fissure. This stuff sucks. <laughs> <laughs> so, before we digress, when I'm doing something surgically and I'm even right back there, this never crosses my mind. <laughs> never. Has never, never will. All I know is I don't want to get into it. All right? So I'm much more worried about my planes. I'm much more worried about if I can see. I'm much more worried about what I'm doing than having some academic thoughts in my head as to what is there. That whole area back there is bad. You just want to stay away from it all, right? But you have to know these. I love that I don't. It's great. <laughs> Okay, so this makes sense. There's a bunch of mnemonics for all this stuff. I would recommend doing these with mnemonics. Yeah, that's a good one. Yep. And then Zizo squared. Is it insights into, is it the sympathetics? There's an S somewhere. You get nasal squared. It is. Yeah, because of nasal squared. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. And then look, Michigan State football team, each other when I do like. And then you can think of the LFTs are out. So all those will help you just think through it. And if anybody wants, I have a good I have a good PowerPoint on that that has all those mnemonics. And if you want it, just email me, I'll send it to you. <laughs> That's a lot of fun stuff right there. <laughs> so this is why, let's get into this for one second, okay? Let's say somebody has a BB, oh, I don't know, like right there. And they ask me if I want to go chase after it. And they're 2020, and they have no diplopia, and they have no issues whatsoever. But they have a lawyer. But they have a lawyer. Do you think I want to touch that? No. I don't think anybody should touch that. And the general consensus is you don't. So if you have an intraocular foreign body like a BB, and it's not causing any problems, then you don't do anything with it. Because the chances of you giving that person problems, coming way back in that apex like that, is crazy high. If they didn't have diplopia afterwards, I would be shot, or they'd lose some vision, right? So, thinking through things is helpful. So branch of which nerve, of thumb division one, branch into what? Superorbital, intracochlear, right? Okay. Axillary nerve, grab that McBain. Okay. Thumbic artery. Okay. All right. This, I think, is really, really important. And we do surgery, like when I do a lot of combined cases with ENT these days. So this is awesome. So to get back into the sphenoid sinus, they do it through the nose, which is really cool. What sinus is it? Sphenoid. Yeah, it's a sphenoid, right? So if they have, like, sweet, if they have the sphenoid, if they have really, really bad sinusitis, right, it's in their sphenoid, that can start to actually affect things pretty quickly, right? So, I mean, this is a really good question because your basic science book or your whatever you call your orbital book, I read that thing over Christmas. Right? It's painful. <laughs> well written, though. It is very well written. So, 
But I'll tell you, there's one thing I disagree with in that book, but then I'll tell you, and this is what you should know for your test, I think. So medial pretarsal is the angular vein, right? Lateral pretarsal is the superficial, temporal. And then the orbital veins, deep branch, and anterior facial, and mature vocal plexus. And here's a picture of it. I think just having a general understanding of that drainage is important. So I'll tell you the thing. So in that book, it says to image the orbit, CT is the imaging modality of choice. It's not, in my opinion, I like an MRI for anything that's truly in the orbit itself. Now, the book does say something in the apex you want to use MRI, which I agree with. And I think for trauma and for uh, bone anatomy, and the CT is obviously superior. But I think the answer for you is imaging modality of choice in general is a CT scan initially in an orbit. If I'm trying to see what something is, like a venal lymphatic malformation or something like that, I'm like an MRI. No question. Orbital septum, where does it come from? Frontal. What's the structure? <laughs> it's from, it's off the periosteum. Oh, I think meant like, uh, yeah. every logic there, it's like, uh, <laughs> Where does it fuse in Caucasians? This is hugely important in surgery. Hugely. Is it the levator that it fuses with? So, to the levator, about two to five millimeters above the tarsus. So when you see any of us make an incision through their lid crease, which is going to be at about 10, right? In a woman, it's a 10. In a guy, it's typically at what? In, an eight, in a Caucasian? Eight, centrally, right? So eight centrally in a man, 10 in a woman. You make that incision, that means the septum's quite a bit above that. So if you cut through and through, let's say you're at 10, right? And you cut through and through, we're going to go skin, orbicularis, then what are you going to hit? Their levator, right? Because the septum is stopped and their levator's there. And then you're going to hit something really fun. What are you going to hit? Their peripheral arcade, because it runs right on top of the tarsus, right? And then you're going to hit their Mueller's muscle. And then you're going to hit their cons, and all of a sudden you're looking at their eye. So anything, anytime we make a lid crease incision, we are always angling. Like, Murray, what do I do every single time? Are you saying you should angle down like this and then turn your body? You're going to angle. You're going to angle up. So we'll always pick it up. We pick the tissue up, right? So I always grab, since I use my right hand, I always grab if we're on the right side. I grab the bottom portion of the incision. You grab the top portion. And you tent it up. I pull it straight back, you tent it up, and I go in at like a 45 degree angle. That allows me to go through the sub, it's the retroorbicularis plane is what it is. You're going underneath the orbicularis in that, basically that the stuff is on top of the orbicularis muscle, right? And then you're getting to the aponeurosis, or not to the aponeurosis, you're getting to the septum, and you're opening it. So you'll never see any of us go straight through the lid crease and just keep cutting straight through right there. We're always angled up. The one exception is if you're trying to get to the top of the tarsus, then we'll make that incision and then go through the orbicularis and then we'll aim down actually to go to the tarsal plate like if we're putting in a gold weight. So the, to me this is critically important to understand. Is it fused to the so the orbital septum comes down, does it fuse to the, like, the aponeuroses of the levator? That's essentially what we're going to be hitting onto, because by then the muscle has transitioned to the aponeurosis. And is it people. like, I mean, I guess, does it come down <coughs> and it's, I, I would assume it's like the anterior portion of the aponeuroses? It's the anterior portion. Okay. And the septum, to be fair, is like multiple onion layers. Yeah. So in, in the book's draw is like one, like, structure, almost like a muscle. It's actually multiple... It's like multiple lamella. But you can think of it as one structure just to like simplify and make it make sense. But just realize the reason it has to stop there, the reason you have a lid crease is because this does stop higher. And then the levator fibers can come forward and give you a lid crease. In a classic Asian lid, it doesn't do that. And that's why it comes down much, much inferior. We're going to talk about that in a second. It comes way more down, and that's why the lid crease is low. It all has to do with where the orbital septum attaches.
So it's huge. Because in the previous slide it says that the levator fuses to the anterior portion of the tarsus. So does it have like fibers that go there and onto the skin? So the septum comes, so levator, you know, I'll come to the side of this. So, so septum comes straight down like this, right? So septum comes straight down, levator is going like this, right? Septum hits it right here, and then it's on the anterior surface of it, and then that allows the levator fibers to come forward and attach down onto the bottom half of the tarsus. But what about the actual lid crease? The lid crease, it says it's for it, the fibers go anterior to the orbicularis muscle. So it's right. both that the it's levator both. fibers. So it's got and it's got multiple attachments, and that's why if I cut through that, the lid doesn't become totic because there's multiple attachments and insertions. Does that make sense? I didn't get that for forever, but that's why you have to aim up. And I think this is like one of the most important things you'll learn from this whole lecture is understanding that in the upper lid, that septum stops because the levator's coming, it's coming at this angle, so the septum's coming straight down, the levator's coming like this, hits into it, that then allows the levator to send its fibers everywhere. And that's what gives you a crease, and that's what goes to the inferior border of the tarsus, and that's how you fold up your lid. Does anybody want me to talk more about it? We good? One other question about the, so like, I know that one of my friend's sisters She's Asian and she had surgery to like create a yeah. leg crease. Mm -hmm. So what what is that surgery mm -hmm. exactly? What do they do? So actually, to do that, that's a very, very common procedure that's performed. So you would make an incision in the lid where you want to put the crease. Let's say it's a woman, let's say it's a 10. And you would have this discussion with them very, very clearly beforehand. So you make that incision at 10 where you want it through one or two. You go through the orbicularis, right? You get down to the septum, which will be really low, because see, it comes all the way down, right, onto the tarsus, so it's, it's way low. You open that up, so you're exposing the levator, and then you, all you do is just take a bite of the skin to the levator at the height you want the crease to be at, and then a bite of the bottom skin. Does that make sense? So you've got your incision here, you take a, the bite of the top portion of the incision, the skin, and then you go through the levator. You have to attach it to the levator right where you want that crease. And then you attach it to the skin. But it's pretty easy to do because essentially if you've made your incision right where you want your crease to be, once you open up your septum, the levator will be right there. You just made the bite right there. It's not hard surgery at all, frankly. It's a very lucrative surgery. So does that, does that make sense? Are you cinching the, the, um, the septum then? No, you just open it. Oh, you just okay. open the septum and you leave it. <coughs> Why? Why do you not recruit? Why do you not put the septum into the suture? Scar, but what will it do? Lag up famos. They won't be able to look down, right? So the septum is really strong. It comes off the periosteum, right? So it's a very strong structure. And the way you can tell intraoperatively if you have it or not, what do you do? So on it, you say, look up, look down, look up, look down, the septum will not move. If it's a levator, they look up and down, it'll move. It's a huge, it's a great way to tell. Not that there's times I can't tell. <laughs> the other day I was like, where are we? It happens all the time. Uh, mental amount of skin, you have to lay with a bluff, upper bluff. Okay. This is hugely important, that's the bare minimum, right? And I see this violated all the time. And then the brow's like like this. And there's like no skin there. And they can't close their eye. It just looks weird, right? This is really important. Okay, so then here, I right, should show you the incision. Uh, okay, doing a lower lid blast. You have to be careful when removing the fat because what is positioned between the blank and the blank fat pads? Okay. So when you do this, so I'm going to go through this with you a little bit. So when you do this, when you do this surgery and you're trying to, these days most people will only debulk these a bit and then they reposition them in the tear trough, right? In either a subperiosteal plane or a preperiosteal plane. So what they've done is they've, they've elevated the smas and everything, all those muscles that move your face, right? 
and then you just stick the fat down in there to try to get rid of the tear trough. To make this a safe procedure, what has been more recently described and people are doing is they actually will move the two fat pads because they're contiguous, right? And you should be able to just go like this. They call it re reverse shoe shine technique is the name guy master gave it. You just you move it and it should be able to freely move because there's a bunch of adhesions between these fat pads and that oblique muscle. So you want those all gone. You'll see people do that with a cautery. I think that's crazy. You can damage all the tissue there, right? So like a Q-tip will totally separate that right up. Just blunt dissection. But that's important because if you hit it and they get torsional diplopia, it's extremely hard to fix. All right, three main causes of involitional entropion. Yeah, so I think rubbing might be one of the reasons they got it right. Oh, okay. Horizontal laxity, okay? No. Disinsertion of the lower eyelid retractors <laughs> of the right navicularis, okay? So you need to correct all three of them. So how do you fix this? I think this would be a great question. How do you fix that? It's the same thing as an epiblepharon as well, by the way. Same idea. So... Lower trussle strip, but then you have to advance the retractors. How do you do that? Where do you make your incisions? Infraciliary, right? Because the way you're going to get to the retractors, infraciliary, so that gets you to the retractors, which means you have to open the orbicularis and the septum, right? Those muscles are always under the septum. So you open the septum. And they're usually disinserted by like a centimeter or so. They're usually pretty far down. It's crazy. So you find them, you reattach them, and then you also do a lateral tarsal strip because you have this laxity, right? What can happen if the retractors are retracted so much and you reinsert them, what can you get after the surgery? Yeah. Okay. The blank can is a position about what millimeters <coughs> higher than the one? Okay, two is pretty, pretty typical. Oh, okay. So where is the peripheral arcade? We just talked about this. <laughs> yeah, so, and exactly where is it superior to what? Yeah, so think about... Think about a pin, and, and the key that's so hard for me to get this is some structures are going straight down, inferior to, superior to inferior, right? Like the septum is straight down. But the levator is going like this. Everything else is going like this. So, and then the tarsus is going to be relatively like this too, straight up and down. So you have to, if you think of it from a side profile, I think it'll be easier for you in your head to picture what's going on and where. Okay. Thinnest bone, a thinnest portion of the maxillary bone in the orbital floor. So where is it most commonly fractured? Right there. <laughs> most commonly fractured orbital bone, the floor. The ethmoid is actually the thinnest, right, in the lamina papricia. But this is actually the most common place you see a fracture. Okay. Uh -huh. It's painful. <laughs> So, so this kind of stuff you see, you, you do, right? So the big ones you're going to see are mucor and then aspergillus. Aspergillus will often actually be more of like an allergic aspergillus. I used to see this in kids all the time in Houston. Brad, did you see this a lot in Houston? Mike, did you see this in Houston? Uh, this no. looked just like peanut butter. <laughs> just like peanut butter. butter. <laughs> I mean, this stuff literally is like scooping out. It was brown, just like peanut butter. It had the consistency of peanut butter. Disgusting stuff. And it's usually an allergy. Okay. What should you, what should you not use interop? And can somebody describe what you see here? I don't know what you see here. <laughs> just know you didn't, you didn't understand. They've got some weirdness going on here. You just did your internships. It's probably a right bundle branch block, right? What do you I think? Know. It's just did the University of Utah's intern year. What an amazing year. So if you see some, here's what I would say. If, if you see some weirdness on their stuff, 
Yeah. You want to avoid the monopolar cautery. Just don't use monopolar. He needs it, right? Monopolar, you gotta be careful. No, I think he, he needs a pacer. He has a pacer. He has a pacer. Oh, has a pacer. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can't use it with a pacer. Yeah, so he's got these spikes. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. What it This is what you do on Bobby, so you don't have to run through this. Alright. What's the mechanism of action of Lion to King? Right, it's so so irregular. Don't even check on Walker, right? Okay. What's the mechanism of action of botulinum toxin? Inhibits release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. These things are important. So, clostridium botulinum, gram positive or negative? It's positive. It's a rod. It's anaerobic. Oh. We talked about that, didn't we? So, anterior lacrimal crest, posterior lacrimal crest. Okay, where should you be entering? Middle. Yeah. <laughs> Alright. Uh, let's see. Does that just make you happy? Yeah, maybe. I saw something. So, I asked a resident once, we were doing it, it reminded me of doing like an endoscopic or something or other, right? I asked a resident one time, one time, we're about to go do surgery on one of his or her patients, right? And I said, well, what is a blepharoplasty? And he or she said, I don't know, but I know you use an endoscope. <laughs> I was like, you show me <laughs> an endoscope in that eye. All right, anyway, DCR, four weeks post-op, okay? And this can be the same for any lid surgery or anything, okay? Yes. Do you see this? You do. Fun times. Fun, fun times to get that treated. They're on stuff for months and months and months trying to get rid of that. Okay, so what do I do for this? Yeah, I, I get ID involved. We figure it out. It takes some months to clear it. It's a bad deal. You don't see it much, but when you do, it's horrible. And what it does, you just keep getting more and more of these things all over their face. So something that occurs about a month later, you start thinking about things like atypical mycobacteria. If it's, if it's acute, it's going to be staph or strep, and it's extremely rare. But if it's a month out, atypical mycobacteria. Orbital mass, what's calling him in? Plum con. Women? Okay, what's common cause of proptosis? Even if it's unilateral? Yeah. Yeah. Is thyroid eye disease a unilateral disease? But it can be very, very asymmetric, right? And then in adults, bilateral thyroid eye disease in kids, it's actually overstated by this. So, all right, enlarged extraocular muscle and imaging. I don't remember this slide. Oh, yeah, tendon sparing, what tears is spinning? What spares tendons? Mm -hmm. Tendon involving? Yeah. I run into this all the time. So this becomes a big deal when I'm trying to get rheumatology to treat this, right? And these days, rheumatology will be treating this too, right? With teprotimumab, right? We just got FDA approval. So that's pretty cool, by the way. So does it work? 83%? Uh, studies look pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So the thing about this, this is important, and these are relatively, what, what's the mnemonic for knowing the order of involvement in the muscles. Slow, slow. slow, right? It actually does follow that pretty well. Okay, so steroids are initially what we do with this. Typically in orbital pseudotumor, with the exception of IgG4 related disease, which we think is the equivalent of what we have called sclerosing pseudotumor for many years. But with the exception of sclerosing pseudotumor or IgG4 related <coughs> disease, they're usually very sensitive to steroids. I'd expect them to respond within 24 to 48 hours max. Okay. You don't need to biopsy it initially. That's a big deal. If you on scan, if it looks like nonspecific orbital inflammation, you can do a steroid trial and that is considered reasonable. And then you do a systemic workup if they don't improve or if they rebound, right? Once you come off the steroid and it was a, if you did a slow taper and they come off of it and the disease reactivates, then that's when you do a biopsy and a systemic workup, okay? I actually think that's a very safe way to go. If, if, if you have a good CT or MRI that shows it looks like non-specific orbital inflammation, it's a safe way to go, and it's unilateral. If it's bilateral, you gotta consider biopsying it. Would I ever biopsy both orbits simultaneously? Never, ever, ever would I do that. 
Why would I do that? What's the advantage to doing that? <laughs> Lower eyelid structure analogous to the levator in the upper lid. That's the capsule of people fascia, right? Arises from the inferior rectus. Okay. Inserts where? So it's just a little different, right? It's on the border of the lower tarsus, whereas, so kind of more like, what muscle? What Mueller's, right? And that's just one major difference. And then, I think this is really important. So you get lower either retraction after you do an inferior rectus recession, right? So this is why in thyroid eye disease, you do a decompression first, and then you do their strabismus, and then you do their lids. This is one of the major reasons why, right? Because remember the I'm, I'm slow demonic, usually involves your inferior rectus, right? Okay, oh gosh. Okay, so wolf ring, non-marginal tarsus borders, right? And they cross this in the corner, right, of the fornices. Yeah. <laughs> now, now everyone just, wants to remember this. <laughs> they are exocrine glands. Okay. Okay. I, I like this question a lot. All right. So if I could ask you something, I'd ask you this kind of stuff. So if it's difficult to match a cannula and it refluxes through the same canaliculus, that means you have narrowing right there, right? So you go through the punctum. You can't push your cannula in far enough. How many millimeters should it go in? About eight, right? Because the punctum, you have two, it's two down, then eight over, right? So you go in, let's say you only get in like three millimeters, and you can't go any farther, and then you try to irrigate, it just comes right out, that same canaliculus, or that same punctum that you were in, right? And that means you have some canalicular scarring. So what are your options to fix that? Picture lower, and they're tearing like crazy. You have two options, really. CDCR is where I would go. You can also try to cut out that scarring portion and put it back together and just put tubes in like a, a Crawford tube, right? My experience with that has been limited, how well that works. If they only have little scars, there's a guy, Brian Beesman is one of the plastic people around who he does a ton of that stuff. Um, he has good results, but I think he, he figures out kind of if they only have a small portion that's like a stenotic area or something, then that's how it works for them. And he basically just marks it off. As soon as he goes in, he marks up where it stops, he cuts it out and it advances it. CDCR would be a very reasonable answer right there. Okay. <clears throat> Difficult to advance and you get reflux for the opposite canaliculus. <laughs> yeah, common canaliculus, right? How many percent, what percentage do people have a common canaliculus? 90. Yeah, 90, right? Able to advance to the sac, but you have reflux of saline and mucoprelin stuff. It's going to be these lacrimal ducts, right? Because the sac, you, you actually know you have some sort of a blockage down farther. Okay. Most common epithelial tumor of the lacrimal gland, benign mixed tumor, or pleomorphic adenoma. How do you treat it? Excision. Complete excision. Why? You can. That's a malignant, right? This is a good one to remember, complete excision on. Most common ocular finding in Parkinson's disease? Yeah, decreased blink. How does that affect my world? Well, if they have a reduced blink rate, and they come in because they have ptosis or dematoclasis, and they live in Utah with our dry climate, I need to be really careful, right, if I'm going to raise their eyelids. So a conversation you have to have beforehand. Most common primary malignancy of the sac. The sac. Organism responsible for necrotizing fasciitis. There are many things that can cause it. What's the most common? Yeah, yeah. good to remember, I think. How do you treat it? <clears throat> so, these days, IV antibiotics are used, you admit them, and then limited debulking on the lids, as little as you have to do, so you're preserving as much tissue as possible. I hardly ever debulk a whole lot of these of these, these days because the IV antibiotics are so good. Uh, but the answer is essentially you keep cutting tissue away 
brain until it bleeds, right? All the tissue's dead and bad, so you do both good. It's the same for something like mucor. You just keep cutting until it bleeds, that tissue's just dead. Marcus gun jaw winking. Oh man, somebody pinned me on this one day. And I was just like, oh. So, yeah, let's go back to that. <laughs> Duragoid muscle, <laughs> connected with the levator muscle. Mike, you and I just saw that, didn't we? Yeah. So, and so what happens? They move their jaw, they go intralateral or contralateral. How's it change? External pterygoid raises the eyelid and internal closes. It just, wow. so I think that's actually, so if they go to the ipsilateral side, what usually happens? Usually the lid kind of goes totic and then the other side it goes, it retracts. <laughs> Lipomian glands, location, superior, inferior tarsus, so they're superior more, they're sebaceous, and they're holocrine glands. It's kind of something I think about every day, it's so exciting. <laughs> 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 you need to know it though, right? Okay, 30 cc's volume. The widest part is one centimeter posterior to the orbital rim. So why does that become important for me? Well, if I'm draining a roof abscess, an orbital roof abscess, right? If I make my lid crease incision or my brow incision or whatever I'm doing, let's say I do a brow incision, okay? And I'm coming down and I cut the periosteum. And if I just go straight back, I'm into orbital contents. Who knows what, right? Whereas if I aim up, because remember the orbit goes up, right? It gets deeper, then I'm going to get into the actual plane I should be in. So you don't want to be poking straight back. Does that make sense? You want to be aiming up. And it's really weird because think about it. You're aiming, fill your orbit, fill how far back that goes up. You need to be aiming, it's a really, it's kind of an awkward angle, so I actually move, and I come, so I'm looking at the patient, like their head's here, and I'm looking up, and I do it that way. It's an easier approach. But that's actually very important for that surgically to know that. <clears throat> Shortest wall. Yeah. So when you see people have a floor fracture, and it involves all the way back, to the inferior orbital fissure, right? That's where it ends. When you're fixing the floor fracture, do you chase a posterior edge? No, you don't. Because if you chase a posterior edge, what are you going to put the implant on? What's back there? You're going to be back in their apex, right? By their optic canal. Does this happen all the time? Like, all the time. The implant's way too big, and then the person will say stuff like, when I look up, I get this real dark spot in my vision. <laughs> It's crazy, right? They're too long. So you don't chase that posterior ledge. If it's, a, if it's a fracture that only involves the middle portion of it, then fine, you can find that posterior ledge. But you don't keep dissecting and try to find a posterior ledge that's not there. How do you know there's a posterior ledge? You look at the sagittal view before you do the surgery, and if it's a huge fracture, they won't have a posterior ledge. Does that make sense? So if you fixate it, Medially, laterally, and then superior and anteriorly, that's plenty. The implant's not gonna go anywhere. Right? Orbital lymphoma, most common location, lacrimal gland fossa. Vast majority are of which type? Non Hodgkin's B cell or malt lymphomas. Very good prognosis. How do you send the biopsy? Fresh. Yeah, fresh. Why? For flow cytometry, right? Specifically here at the University of Utah, I have found flow completely, utterly worthless. They always tell me it's poor viability. Doesn't matter how much I send them. It's like, but it's the standard of care. You gotta send it. A lymphoproliferative lesion arising in this preactive site gives the highest risk of developing a systemic non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. I think that is a great question. Eyelid. It's not the lack of gland fossa. Locations of eyelid basal cells. List from most to least common location. So lower, medial canthus, upper, lateral canthus. Let's go back to that. Thyroid. Thyroid. If anyone cares. Yeah, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like, think about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that sounds right. Yeah, 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 it is actually right. Yeah, yeah that's a good way of looking at it. So, Depending on which side you're looking at, right? This is where you can get into trouble with a basal cell. If this gets back into their orbit, that's a problem. 
What's the drug you can use now if you have somebody who can't have surgery and you're worried about trying to control some things? Bismodigib. Yeah, Bismodigib is a sonic hedgehog inhibitor. I'd be aware of it. The number one side effect, side effect, they have skin changes and hair loss. Malignant like melanoma on the eyelid, most important prognostic factor for patient survival. What do you think? Yeah, it's, a, it's always going to be the depth, right? For melanoma. What's that? Okay. Is ODA, risk of viewing melanoma, 1 in 400. What percentage get glaucoma? 10. Risk of UV melanoma, six in a million. Okay. Congenital okay, eyelid and abnormality. Sorry, I'm going super fast because we don't have much time. I had a whole other lecture for you, too. Um, so, this, what is this? Specifically, this is an epiblepharon in a kid, right? How do you treat it? The same way we were talking about this overriding orbicularis. You make that infraciliary incision right here. Do the majority of these kids need surgery, or can you watch the majority? Watch. Okay, why? Why you, can you watch it? Lower yeah, it's so a lower lid. If it were the upper that was doing that, you'd probably have a much bigger problem because of the excursion of the lid. But as their nasal dorsum grows, so as their nose grows, it tends to actually pull that whole region into a better position. So a lot of the kids will grow out of this. Again, same deal we talked about, right? So let's see. Oh, what's that? Yeah, how do you treat that? That's yeah, awesome. You just cut the thing. Um, this and separate. So then, let's do. Oh, okay, what's this? Yeah. How do you treat a urea bluff run? So you you can try. So that's what I would what I would do is pull on this just like I would to see if like you have a cicatricial versus an involutional electropion, right? I would see how tight this is, and you could consider a lateral torsal strip. You might have to do a skin graft right here. And you can't, in a kid, you really can't do like a mid-face advance or anything. It's not as if they're mid-face descended. They just don't have enough anterior lamella, right? So, now let's do classic condition. It's a blepharophimosis. Ptosis, epicanthus inversus, telecanthus, right? So, Almost invariably, these kids need their lids raised. Let's see how much brow recruitment there is here. And then usually you can do treatments here too. So you can do nas transnasal wiring is a good way to do it. I actually don't do that. I do a little Nike sign incision right here. Um, I just learned from watching a cool video on AEO's website. It's great. <laughs> and you just you tuck that in. It used to be they did that little like the little man figure right here. You just bring all that stuff in. It's multiple incisions. It looks terrible. But a small little swoosh right here can get rid of all this stuff. It's pretty nice. Let's see. Yeah, we talked about all that. So it's interesting. I've only seen that in a couple of people. So, and it is, as I have one family, like every single person has it. But then the majority of ones I see are sporadic. So. Uh, oh, okay, this is good. So, and th this is based on your book. I don't necessarily agree with all this, but it is what it is, right? So, if I have a defect that's even 90% of the lower lid, I'll still do a, a tensile flap. I take it all the way over. So, I was at a conference where J.D. Perry was describing that, and I'm like, that's what I'm going to do from now on. Instead of doing a, uh, a what? Yeah, instead of doing a Hughes flap, right? So Hughes would be if you're doing the lower, and then a cutlip period would be if you're doing it into the upper from the lower. Makes sense. So direct closure. Again, these numbers are really arbitrary because if you have a young person, they have a 33% defect, I can't close that directly. I can't. They're too tight. Like if I try to do that in any of you, I don't think I could get it closed. I think your lid would probably go underneath your eye, particularly if you have a negative vector, right? So if your malar region is, is less than your eye protrudes, it's probably going to go underneath your eyeball. Right, so I don't think that's an ideal, but anyway, for 30 to 50, lateral can thought to be in semi-circular flap or tensile, right? And then defect greater than 50, 
Cut the beard. Use. For your intents and purposes, that's what I would say. Realistically, for me, that's still a tensile flap. I only do a Hughes flap if, no, so yeah, I only do a Hughes if it's like more than 90%. And then I never do that. I would do all kinds of other stuff, but for your intents and purposes, that's what you do. Thyroid disease, so responsible, or okay, fibroblast, right? So what do you get? Glycosamine and glycans, right? More common in females. Very good. Yeah, very good. Most common scene I can finding is the liver retraction, right? Okay, we're almost done. We are done, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so, that was okay. Nice. So, I think all that stuff on there is important to understand. The gland things are just easy. And it's... So, when I said the OCAM, I thought this stuff was like a joke. Nobody cared. It didn't matter. They care a lot now. So, just do your best as far as like fellowships and stuff go. And it's the only time in your life when you can actually like dedicate this much time to studying. I know it's hard because you're busy on call and stuff. Do the best you can. It's worth it. So, study hard and just with that kind of stuff. All the question answers are supposedly in the basic science book. So, Tim Stout used to be my chair as the chair of that OCAD committee. And, every, and he makes it very clear, every question comes from, from the book. So, all right, go enjoy your day.